really appreciate the opportunity to be here today and to uh, welcome everyone to this second in a series of four GyroLab sponsored webinars. Today's topic is focused on the application of the GyroLab platform to the development of fit for purpose validated assays uh, for biomarkers in support of biotherapeutic and even small molecule drug development. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and get started. As a host for this, I just wanted to make everyone aware that I am the field manager or the manager of field application scientists at Gyros in North America. And I get the privilege of working with customers day in and day out using our technology to develop many different types of assays on the platform. But as I said, today's focus will be on uh, biomarkers and the validation, fit for purpose validation of biomarker assays on the platform. Before I begin, I want to just uh, talk briefly about the agenda. We'll, I'll give you a bit of an overview to gyro, Gyros and the Gyros immunoassay platform. I'll introduce uh, our speakers. Today we have Kerry Oliver, who's a general partner at Radix Biosolutions, Chad Ray, who's a director at Pfizer, Ariella Van de Sample, a senior research associate in pharmacology at Adlinx in Belgium, and Mark Dysinger. Senior Scientist at Pharmacokinetics and Dynamics and Metabolism in Pfizer Global Research and Development in Groton, Connecticut. In between each of the assays, I think there will be some opportunity for Q&A, and we'll also have some additional time for discussion at the conclusion of the last seminar. So at any time, please feel free to send your questions, and we'll get to them when we have an opportunity. Gyros as a company was founded in 2000 a privately held company that is uh, developed in Uppsala, Sweden. We, we contain development, manufacturing, and logistics, worldwide marketing, sales, and support and service, and a senior man management with over 50 years of experience in the biotech supply industry. Currently, Gyros employs about 60 employees worldwide. We have subsidiaries in the US, UK, Germany, and France, and a distributor network in the Asia Pacific Middle East. Africa, and Eastern Europe. Our mission is to transform immunoassay performance activity. By performance, we really mean a robust assay platform that offers a broad dynamic range with high precision, reproducibility, and sensitivity required from biotherapeutic PK and biomarker applications, suitability for a variety of matrices. By productivity, we refer to the ability to develop assays quickly to get uh, faster results that allow for data-driven decisions as you move a project through the pipeline. And also the ability to save on sample, reagent, and animal usage. In addition, productivity for us means that you're spending less time at the event, so you save analyst time, and you have easier technology transfer both between sites and to CRO partners. As an example of how we think the gyro lab can save time, labor, sample, and reagents. We have this comparison that was presented at the gyro lab seminar in 2010 by Kerry Velozzi and Mandy Cavusi at Pfizer, where they showed the comparison between doing a PK type assay on an ELISA versus a gyros. And what you notice when you look down the list of gyros versus ELISA characteristics is 10 times less volume, 10 times shorter runtime broader dynamic range, tenfold lower MRD for the gyro lab versus ELISA, about 2.3 times faster development time uh, for the, the assay on the gyros versus the ELISA. The built-in automation for gyro lab had several benefits, including uh, helping to eliminate interruptions from desk work that were required if you have a manual ELISA with multiple steps that require an intervention. Also, the gyro lab with its automation has the capability to run overnight. These features have led to adaptation or applications with it across a broad variety of uh, uh, in the drug development pipeline from early discovery and development through clinical trials into post-marketing surveillance. We've also developed a new ADA application that's used for immunogenicity and other applications that are used in bioprocess. But as we think about a fit-for-purpose investment in biomarkers through the development of drugs, we're really 
talking about staged investments as a drug moves through the pipeline to both better understand the relevance of a particular biomarker, the, uh, that is the underlying biology, as well as greater and greater control over the validation and control over the analytical assay, the analytical method that's being used to measure that biomarker, which has some similarities and differences to biotherapeutic assay development. What I'd like to do now is sort of give just a quick overview of the GyroLab immunoassay platform so that we all start with a common understanding about the platform, how it's used, and then with then allow the presenters to just get right to the data. But the platform is an instrument that sits on your bench and it contains a carousel that's available for loading your sample reagents and samples and reagents. Uh, it contains a liquid handler that allows for transfer of uh, materials from the sample plates to the surface of a unique BD shaped uh, assay plate. It's automated and has an integrated workflow uses a high sensitivity laser induced fluorescence detection system and this is all built in a system where the hardware and software is 21 CFR part 11 compliant. Short turnaround times that is less than an hour per CD for 112 data points and five CDs per run for a total of up to 560 data points per run. Make the gyro lab automated platform, relatively high throughput option for one to consider when doing ligand binding assays. A closer look at the CD shows that the heart of this system is a streptavidin bead, which you can functionalize with any biotinylated capture reagent, and along with the analyte and the detection reagent, uh, form a sandwich which can be used for a ligand binding assay. These beads are encased within a 15 nanoliter affinity column, and a flow-through design allows us to build assays on this affinity column using affinity capture as the final step in the assay. Leading up to the column are a series of reagent channels which allow us to use a combination of capillary flow and centrifugal force when you spin the CD to load all samples and uh, reagents in parallel and flow things directly over the column so that we have one structure and one data point with no crosstalk. The CDs are organized such that eight microstructures are incorporated into one segment connected by a common reagent channel so that we work in groups of eight on a segment. CDs, depending on the volume of sample used in each CD, are between 12 and 14 segments per CD. The output that we see from this system is an analytical method that has broad dynamic ranges. What's shown here is a standard curve or two standard curves laid over top of one another, where the analyte of interest was done on two different volumes of CD, a 20 nanoliter CD versus a 200 nanoliter CD. And you can see that individually we get about four logs of linear dynamic range. But uh, when we take into consideration the option of using multiple CD types for the same assay, we can get extend that dynamic range out to six or even seven logs of linear dynamic range for at a given assay. The unique thing about this system is that we can also investigate the individual column profiles for each data point. What's shown here is a, an example of a column profile. The radius goes in this direction, and thus the direction of flow through the column is in this orientation. And you can see the retained fluorescence on the column is converted into an image that shows that the higher the intensity of fluorescence, the higher the signal or the higher the peak on the column, and the integrated area under this peak becomes the relative fluorescence units that uh, are the resulting data point that gets converted into your standard curve or your unknown. So it's a flexible assay format with an open, that's an open platform. Dramatic reduction in matrix interference and a nanoliter scale flow through technology. Compatible with many matrices, a human or animal sera, plasma or sputum, CSF, and other octave matrices, and cell supernatant. 
We could also look at the strip data encoded feeds and develop multiple. This is an open platform that allows us to use different formats for uh, running our assays, including a sandwich assay, a generic PK type assay, an indirect antibody assay, or a bridging assay. The Gyrolab BioAffi CD comes in, in uh, three different CD sizes, which allows us to scale the assay according to the, the sensitivity required for the assay. So there's no need to redevelop the assay. In this case, we can use either a 20, a 200, or a 1,000 nanoliter CD in order to scale the assay at an appropriate level for the intended purpose. The Gyrolab software also includes control and evaluator and viewer software that allows us to analyze the data and view individual column profiles so that we can visualize the fluorescence data for each column data point. This facilitates both assay development and selecting the optimal reagents. Also, it gives us an opportunity to investigate quality control differences or outliers that might, be, uh, might appear in the data. GyroLab Control then uses a template methods with the user-friendly wizard that uses a wizard that allows us to design experiments in a streamlined way. We can then uh, evaluate the data using the viewer and the GyroLab evaluator in which we can quantify the data from the resulting unknowns. The performance and productivity is refined by obtaining high quality data with a broad dynamic range. What I hope you'll see in the data that's presented with our guest speakers today is a reduced matrix interference and excellent precision and reproducibility that will reduce analyst time and that will have faster turnaround times uh, for assay development both days and results within, uh, within an hour in many cases. That will also reduce sample volume and the animals required to do uh, biomarker work. So fit for purpose biomarker assay development is, is here to understand how a staged assay development process is going to work. You're going to stage your investments in assay development along a continuum. Validation of the biomarker is also a validation to understand what the biology is versus the validation of the bioanalytical method. In many cases, in early discovery phases, these two uh, things will go on simultaneously. Whereas at later stages, we're, look, we're thinking about both bioanalytical and biologically relevant at the stage of project types and decisions that are made. Later stages of project development, greater rigor will be placed on the level of analytical validation required. And so one of the advantages that you get with a gyros, gyros platform is as you progress down the stages of drug development with greater and greater bigger, uh, rigor being applied to the biomarker assay development, a rapid platform that's automated uh, definitely shortens the cycle times for, for moving uh, an assay through validation steps. With that, I'd like to uh, close by reminding everyone that we had a prior webinar that's available online on PK and PD. Uh, we will have an upcoming uh, web webinar on immunogenicity in September and the fourth biomarker on bioprocess November 2nd. That, I'll hand it over to Chad and Terry Oliver, who will talk about their experience using the GyroLab and uh, developing biomarker assays. All right, thanks, Rob. Today, Carrie and I are going to talk, give a perspective uh, from both industry and CRO on how assays can be, in essence, co-developed. And uh, this is something that's near and dear to my heart. Recently. Well, for the last three years, I've led an initiative through AAPS known as the 21st Century Lab. And uh, just two months ago, that theme issue was released. And myself and uh, Ago Ahaney, who, who's my fellow uh, partner in this endeavor, you know, published an editorial. And in that, we outlined the overall objectives of the, the initiative. And you know, really, it's, it's broken down into what we call the three Ps. And the first part was the, the persuasion element or the, the goal of educating on what some of the gaps were in the current lab environment. And uh, the, second the second part of the initiative, really, which just kicked off last week at the AAPS meeting, is all about partnership. So I think this webinar is quite timely in that what we're talking about here is, is developing assays really across this continuum of you know, what we may do in pharma will certainly impact impact our partners in the CRO industry. And, and the same is true. I think there's reciprocal learning that can be accomplished uh, 
from the CRO back to, to pharma. So that's what we want to highlight today. Really, you know, the third part of the, the initiative is all about profit, which I think is uh, ultimately what's going to, you know, make this the 21st century lab initiative successful. And so if you start, if you start in the upper uh, part of the slide, you can see that, that companies like Gyros certainly have a, a goal, which is to develop high-end products that will allow us in the lab an opportunity to you know, generate better data, which is our tool, if, if you will, in, in the, eco, the future ecosystem. And then that high-quality data that maybe you know, that we're generating faster or things that we've never been able to measure before will ultimately make it to our internal decision makers who can then better inform our product label, which will then be sold to the regulatory agencies who at the end of the day are, are actually selling safety and efficacy to the patients, who ultimately will then buy our products, which will then further fuel the cycle, with the goal being to actually reduce cycle time, which you see there. So the hope is, uh, by again, by us investing in high quality products, we can help to reduce that cycle time and ultimately fuel this, uh, this profit cycle, which I think will be you know, the success for the future. So specifically within my lab, we focus on three key areas, uh, three key platforms, if you will, immunoassays, cell biology, and mass spectrometry. We use those uh, technology platforms to address key areas of pharmacokinetics, biomarkers, and anti-drug antibody support. So we're always looking for uh, new and better ways to approach difficult problems. So I, uh, last year I read a book by Donald Phillips that was titled Lincoln on Leadership. And within that book, Donald Phillips points out how well uh, Abraham Lincoln was truly an innovator. He's the only U.S. president to ever have a patent uh, where actually he, you can see it where my pointer is now, it, it was designed to uh, get boats that were stuck on, on reefs off of the reef. Well, he also used that same approach to, to help the Union Army win the war, to find tools that would allow them to have much more you know, a better chance of winning the war. So, you know, at Pfizer, we're, we're trying to do the same thing. And, and as I start to evaluate tools, you know, that could potentially better our lab, I'm really thinking in three areas. First of all, can they help us to work smarter? And that's what we're going to focus today is some of the ways that I believe the Gyro Lab has helped us work smarter or faster. You heard Rob talk about some of the benefits around speed and development time, cycle time reduction. I really believe the Gyro Lab can do that. And then finally, you know, will a tool allow us to measure things that we were no longer, we were previously not able to measure either because of sample volume restrictions or potentially sensitivity? What I'm going to focus on today really is around working smarter. And I think this is essential when you're trying to transfer assays to partners and, you know, again, this back and forth between the CRO and the pharma lab. So within our lab, we've developed this, uh, what I would consider a three-stage process for developing assays on the Gyro Lab. It really starts with antibody screening, and I'll take you through an exercise we did with CASPase 3 that sort that illustrates, you know, again, the advantages of, of how this system can work in a rather rapid manner. Once we identify the right pair of reagents, we'll do, you know, basic uh, range finding in terms of what is, you know, how what's our standard curve look like, what's the appropriate matrix to work in. Once we have that locked down, then we move into uh, stage two, which is uh, the phase where we apply design of experiments techniques to further uh, identify those critical variables in the process, and then also we finalize that with a response surface design, which which uh, defines the optima for all for those parameters. Then we we finalize in our final stage. We actually monitor the performance with either a quick. Well, first we do a quick prediction confirmation. I'll go into a little detail on that, and then we. Uh, continue to monitor that in study, and I'll show some data on how uh, you know, the performance has been. So really, for just as a very quick overview of, of design of experiments, in case you're not familiar with this, basically design of experiments is a way to take many factors that potentially affect a process and then look at those simultaneously as opposed to doing it one factor at a time. And the advantages here are you can have a lot of factors that you can distill down to a very uh, small number of critical variables that then you can go on to further refine and understand the optimum. You have to understand what your response variable is and then you can measure that. But 
the advantages, in addition to being able to fully optimize, you know, uh, would be that you can identify interaction. Sometimes uh, two parameters may actually be affecting each other, and with design of experiments, you can identify those, whereas with one factor at a time approaches, it's not possible. So we like this approach, and I, you know, I summarized how we're implemented. I'll show you a little bit more data that, uh, where we've used it. But I mentioned in the first stage that the antibody screening, really with the gyro lab, we find this to be one of the, uh, you know, really uh, a nice selling point for the, for the technology. What we did here uh, on the left, we ran full st uh, seven point standard curves with a blank. This is the cast phase three uh, antibodies. And what we were trying to do was to find the ideal pair. What I'm showing is a, it's a cell plot that we've created in JUMP. Basically, we have six different antibodies that were labeled either with biotin, which are the A through F, or with alexafluor 647, which are the 1 through 6. And you can see when you pair them, uh, first of all, the wizard makes it quite simple to design these experiments, but then the output, we can take the standard curves and then just plug this into JUMP to get a quick heat map of where the, where the best uh, pairs are. And you can see in this case, A6 probably looks like the best, but again, because of the simplicity of the system and the limited sample volume that you use, you can then do a second uh, screening, which in this case, because it's CAS phase 3, we want to understand the difference between the zymogen and the active form. So we took active cast base, which is here, and then compared that to the pro form. And you can see that in the A4 pair and the A6, you're getting a nice differential between the active form and the pro form. So once we identify those pairs that we like, so not only do we use the heat map, but we do also take the, the raw data and we'll, we'll compare signal to noise, or in this case, the, you know, the overall curve shape versus, uh, of the active versus the pro form. We identify those uh, key pairs, and then we move into, in this case, I'm just showing uh, the response surface. So for those of you that, that don't know, a response surface design is different from a screening design in that you include a midpoint. A, uh, midpoint. So in this case, we ran eight experiments, eight different combinations of capture and detection at three different levels, 10, 50, and 100. So in each experimental parameter, uh, we are running a full standard curve in duplicate with uh, quality controls at both the perceived high and low levels. And at each of those, there are n equals four replicates. So we can get an estimate of both the accuracy and the precision, which we combine to form total error, which is nice because you can take that information in the early development. You know, in this case, these are the observed total errors. So we plug that information in to jump, and then we'll get a we'll get a uh, a model that's generated. But again, the value of total errors is a parameter that we can follow then into the in study phase of uh, development. So this is after we've taken the, we've run the experiment. I showed you the the results and the total error. Now the model is built. This is on the left. This is called a prediction profiler, and that's again another output from jump that will allow us to then identify across the bottom here. First of all, the, the objective here is, is to maximize desirability, which in this particular experiment, the goals, the prediction profiler is an output from uh, the JUMP software system. Again, the goal here is to take the, the data that we input, build a model, and identify, in this case, the key, the key parameters and then also their, their actual levels that would you know, build the most optimal essay. So again, the goal is to optimize or define the most desirable set of conditions. In this case, we want to minimize the low and high total error and maximize the signal to noise ratio. When you do that, JUMP has defined that 82 micrograms per mil capture and 4.8 nanograms per mil detection are the two ideal set of conditions. And then from that, the estimates are total error, if you look over here on the left in the red, the total error value for the low should be about 6.5 plus or minus 17. So now that becomes our range that we're shooting for. Same is true for the high total error. So about a, it's estimating that we should have roughly a 25% assay. If you then look over here, this is some of the early in-study data, 
that we collected, and you can see the total error for the first four runs for the LQC is 15, definitely within the 23% uh, predicted. And the same is true, it's almost identical to the predicted number of 6.1, we're seeing 7.2 for the high. So it's a good example, but then we've, we've done this now in six different uh, assays that we've developed, and from that what we're seeing, uh, just in summary, is in gen our assays have about a 7.1 percent total error with the mean in study then being about 10.2. So overall that's 1.6 fold difference from our predicted. And what I'm looking at to come up with those assumptions, again the range that I showed you on the last slide then becomes the target and then again with the, the error associated with that. And you can see that in general our predictions are very close to what the, the estimates were. And in fact out of 12 or 11 uh, possible combination or 11 examples, 91% of those were within the, the predicted range and I already mentioned that it was within 1.6 volts. So this is important because again we now have a, a metric that will allow us to look at the early development phase and then predict what will happen in the in-study environment. So that's important as you try to outsource assays or even uh, just develop assays in your own lab. So that's not the only benefit. We, we then did a more of a retrospective analysis of the way we developed assays in the past with one factor at a time and plate base. So you just take the same high and low QCs and look at the total error in those examples. In our uh, one factor at a time plate based approach, we were getting about 20% total error. However, when we now combine DOE and gyros, we're finding that the, the total error has dropped down to about 10%. And you may ask, well, what, you know, how important is that? Well, it depends on your objectives, but if your goal is to look at the, uh, say, a biomarker, and you want to be able to distinguish a 10% difference and say that it's a statistically significant difference, and with a 10% total error, which is shown here in the black uh, dots, you can see that you only need 34 samples, whereas if you had a 20% total error, you would need 134 samples. So that's pretty significant improvement in the number of animals used and, and ultimately the ability to make a decision. So with that, I think the last thing I would want to say is, uh, you know, we always need integration and I think that's, that's true even when you're identifying a partner. You want to find one that shares your value system and, and agrees with the same style and development process. So I think that's a good segue for, for me to turn it over to Carrie, who's going to talk about Radix Biosolutions and, and how they develop assays and what they think about. Thank you. Thanks, Chad, and, and thanks everyone this morning for uh, for calling in. Just to give you a little background, Radix is a, uh, a custom assay development and uh, kit manufacturing group, and we really believe in that in that second uh, portion of the 21st century lab mantra of, of partnership, and that's how we very often deal with our customers. We look at it more as a partnership with them. And that's why uh, Chad and I are splitting time today just to show you how we, we partner and have partnered with, with Chad and his group. Chad just got done showing you how you can use the design of experiments on, on the GyroLab platform to develop uh, robust and rugged assays. And, and this is just a, a three-dimensional plot of a response surface map leveraging off of what Chad just showed you where you've got on um, two of the dimensions, two of the factors that uh, affect the quality of your assay, and the third, the vertical uh, axis then uh, representing the response. And you can see that there's a hump there in the middle that shows you the, the optimal range of where those uh, two variables should be maximized. And so then once you've got an assay that's been optimized along using design of experiments, the real question is, is what's next? And, and other than just creating a great assay, why do you want to use this and move forward? And the ultimate goal for any of us, whether we're a, uh, a kit manufacturer like, like we are, whether you're a uh, pharmaceutical company and you've developed an in-house assay and you're getting ready to transfer it out to a CRO, or if you're a group that is now trying to move your assays that you've developed to either multiple sites or multiple uh, analysts within your group, the real core goal of, of uh, what design of experiments can do for you in, in the GyroLab platform is really comes down to equivalency. And 
the more equivalent, the more reproducible you can make your assays, the better the transfer will go. And what you're actually looking at here are four uh, independent standard curves that have been generated for the, the same assay, independently uh, created standards run on the, uh, the same assay. And uh, you're just going to have to take my word for it that there's four lines there because they're so overlapped that it really looks like a, a dotted green and yellow line. Um, those are the kinds of things that design of experiments in the Gyro Lab platform can give you at the end of the day. Once you've got that assay, there's still variables that can affect as you transfer these assays out from site to site. There's still variables that can occur that can affect the performance of your assay at each one of those sites. And this will just go through the list of those variables, and then the slides following will address how uh, Radix addresses those as well as how the GyroLab platform addresses those variables. So the first is buffers and reagents. If you start with a kit that is, is only your uh, antibody reagents and doesn't contain the buffers, the buffers can lead to a, a big shift in, in overall assay performance and variability. Manual dilution of samples and, and your standards and the, the pipetting accuracy of each individual group as well as even the tubes that you use for those uh, samples and standards can greatly affect the, uh, the performance of your assay and, and the reproducibility of it. And lastly, uh, the instrument. And there's a number of variables that can occur in the instrument. And I think the GyroLab platform's done a good job of addressing those variables and minimizing those variables. And those can be uh, include the detection side of things, whether it's the excitation source or the detector itself. The instrument method that you use to acquire the data can greatly affect the performance of your assay and the reproducibility as well as, in the case of the GyroLab, the pipetting station. And many of the platforms that we deal with in immunoassays don't come with a pipetting station, and therefore you are left to your own devices to uh, perform reproducible pipetting. So from the, the Radix side of things, solutions to some of those variables are is when we provide a kit to our customers or our partners, and if at all possible, based on the stability of the analyte that we're looking at, we will provide a kit with pre-diluted standards, pre-diluted QCs, as well as a dilutional QC that come in that kit. And they're ready to use and ready to move forward from once you receive that kit. In addition, we provide you all the assay buffers, so you don't have to make up assay buffers yourself and add that variability in. We remove that source of variability, and as well as the instrument method. If you order a uh, GyroLab kit from us, we will provide you a thumb drive or a file access point where you can download the instrument method so you're assured that the instrument method that you're using on your system is going to be identical to what we've developed off of. And then lastly on here is a branded product that we've started on, on multiple platforms, including the GyroLab, which we call assay checks. And these are a group of reagents that are used to check the reagents that come within your kit as well as the instrument functionality. So we have tests, we have reagents to be able to test the biotinylase capture antibody, your fluorochrome labeled antibody, and instrument functionality before you ever run a kit. From the GyroLab side of things, um, as I mentioned earlier, I think they've done a, a wonderful job of being able to reduce and address some of the variabilities that you would see in a normal immunoassay. What they've done on, on their side of things is They've gen generated a uh, functionality test kit that lets you know that all the inner workings of the GyroLab Gyro platform are working at the time that uh, you're running. They provide you with an integrated pipetting station, which reduces the error that you might have um, by hand pipetting. And it's a fully automated assay system. And so it's not just the pipetting that's automated, but it's all the washing and the incubation variables that might occur during you running an assay. And lastly, as a single vendor provider of the hardware and consumables, you can be assured that every single time you get a piece of hardware from them or a consumable from them, it's going to match their quality assurance records and requirements that they have for providing those things. So you have a greater chance of consistency having a single vendor provider of, of those products. So how Chad and I are just in the case part, at the part right now of doing a method transfer between us. And this is kind of a flow chart of the, the things that will occur as we go through this uh, method transfer. And so 
to assure that both of our instruments are operating properly, we'll start with running the functionality test kit to assure both systems are, are in working order. We can then perform using the assay checks reagents, ensure that the uh, assay reagents that we've created for this kit are working properly and that the instrument is giving the same amount of signal from instrument to instrument. Then during the method transfer, we then provide finished kits for both sides to work off of. We start with the finished kit and then look and at the end and do a reagent swap where Chad's group will, will produce reagents and we'll produce reagents. We'll swap them to ensure that we're uh, getting equivalent transfer of assay and equivalent results in the assay. I think in, in conclusion to this, I believe that with these, with these tools put in place and the capabilities of the GyroLab platform, the capabilities of design of experiments, and a, a partnership uh, type of relationship between uh, your CRO and, and your pharmaceutical company, you've got the best chance that when you do method transfers, you're going to get the uh, results and the equivalency that are really required to uh, to minimize variability between sites. And with that, I'd like to thank everyone. Very nice. Thanks. Thanks both to Chad and uh, Carrie. Carrie, one of the questions that came in while you were speaking was, uh, do you produce kits for assays that we have developed? That is to say, I assume that this the questioner was asking if they had developed an assay, would you produce a kit for it? Sure, absolutely, and that's that's part of our our business model at Radix. We will we will custom develop assays, or if you've developed an assay, you can transfer over the uh, basically the the manufacturing instructions for us, and we will manufacture the uh, kits for you and provide them back to you. Yes, I guess one of the things in doing the comparison, it wasn't absolutely clear to me from the slides. I lost some of the slides for a moment there, Chad. But can you address the question of you know, you've done sort of the DOE with a typical plate-based system and the DOE with a gyro system. I wonder, you know, have we overstated in any way the time savings that, you know, I laid out on the first slide? I know that's a question that many potential users of our platform and certainly seasoned immunoassay developers press me uh, often on the speed with which we can do assay development, and I wonder if your experience doing the DOE showed that there was a significant time savings in the plate-based versus or in the gyros versus the plate-based systems. Yeah, I think this is an opportunity for me to uh, to recognize and, and thank the, the, my group, Allison Given, Annette Wu, and Jia Guo, who have, who have done this work, and, and I think Allison did a very nice analysis of the time savings, and what she decide, or defined was about 20 days on average to get a fit-for-purpose method using a plate-based approach. Uh, however, with the Gyro Lab, we, can, we now believe we can do that in about six days. So, and that's, again, that's combining the screening approach, the DOE, and a confirmation experiment, you know, to, uh, to get to a point where we feel confident in the performance characteristics of the assay. So we're estimating somewhere about a, you know, 70% time savings uh, doing, you know, comp, uh, combining these two approaches. So I don't think you're understating it. And I mean, I, think about it. The the one hour turnaround time gives you a significant advantage in the earliest stages of development. If you find out something, you can quickly turn that around. The wizard gives you the ability to quickly take the information that comes out of jump and program it in a simple to use manner. Anybody that's done DOE manually or tried to use a liquid handler knows how difficult both of those tasks are. So the gyro lab gives a, a, a vehicle for getting you know, uh, DOE design implemented rather rapidly. And Allison just recently gave a talk uh, at AAPS on that. So I, I don't think we're under, you're understating it at all. And if anything, you know, I, I, I certainly uh, am a big advocate of, of the integration of the two approaches. We feel like it gives us a much more robust approach to developing assays. Excellent. Thanks. With that, I guess I will turn over the um, uh, presentation to um, Ariella van de Sample, who's a senior research associate in pharmacology at AdLynx. Take it away, Ariella. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. So I'm Ariella van de Sample, and I work as a senior research associate within the pharmacology department at AdLynx. And there, I help guiding nanobodies from preclinical pre to clinical development. 
So today I will present you fit for purpose development and validation of a challenging biomarker assay on Jarolab for novel nanobody for candidate. Here you can see the outline of today's presentation. So I will start with a short introduction on Evlinks and the nanobody platform. Then I will explain you what target biomarkers are. And subsequently I will focus on the development and validation of the challenging biomarker assay on Jarolab measuring free IL-6 receptor levels in Sinomobis monkey samples. Then I will show its application using some preclinical biomarker results and end with some conclusions. So I will start with a short introduction on Ablinks. Ablinks is a biopharmaceutical company situated in Ghent in Belgium. We are still a young and dynamic company uh, engaged in the drug discovery and development of nanobodies, which are also called the, ne the next generation biologics. In total, we currently have more than 25 nanobody programs in the pipeline. And we have more than we have actually seven nanobody products in the clinical uh, development phase. About one year ago, we achieved the first clinical proof concept for nanobody in clinical. So, but what are these nanobodies? Nanobodies are a novel class of therapeutic proteins derived from single domain antibodies. So, as you all know, conventional antibodies consist of both heavy and light chains, which are both required for antigen binding and stability. But Besides these conventional antibodies, members of the Candidate family also have single-chain antibodies only consisting of heavy chains, so also calling, called heavy-chain antibodies, in their bloodstream. Similar as to the conventional antibodies, these heavy-chain antibodies also consist of a constant and variable part. And it's this single variable domain, which still has its full antigen binding capacity, that Ebbing's called the nanobody. So nanobodies are actually the smallest functional fragments of a naturally occurring heavy chain antibody. So of course these nanobodies have a unique potential. They combine actually um, the advantages of conventional antibodies, like a high affinity and a high specificity, with advantages of small mo molecules. For example, their small size allows tissue penetration and cavity binding, which results in improved target applicability. They are also very robust, which allows for alternative routes of administration, and they can be flexibly formatted, tailoring the, their half-life, or to have a polyclonal antibody activity or combination therapy just in one molecule. Here you can see um, Ablink's internal and synth programs. So we have currently more than 25 uh, R&D programs in the pipeline. Some of them are partners with leading pharmaceutical companies. Uh, seven nanobody products are already in clinical development phase. Uh, three are in phase one, and four of them are in phase two. And one of them is actually ALIC61, targeting IL-6 receptor, and for which I will tell you something more. So the project goal was to develop ALIC61 as an anti-inflammatory treatment for IL-6-related disorders. One of, these, one of these disorders is human rheumatoid arthritis, in which the IL-6, IL-6 receptor pathway plays an important role. So ALIC61 was developed with a high affinity binding to both soluble and membrane-bound IL-6 receptor, and it inhibits the interaction between IL-6 receptor with its ligand IL-6 with a high potency. This interaction is a monovalent interaction, as it only uh, consists of one um, nanobody building block against um, IL-6 receptor, and for disease indication, it was half-life extended by targeting uh, human serum albumin. So now I will uh, tell you something more about target biomarkers. Due to complex formation, biologicals often affect the plasma concentrations of their antigen on target by increasing or decreasing their half-life. So these targets can be used as biomarkers and demonstrate that the drug is interacting with its target, and they can also correlate with receptor occupancy. In order to understand the PKPD behavior of these biologicals, the measurement of the antigen or, um, or target occupancy is necessary. And as represented in the figure below, the antigen occupancy can be derived from both the free and the total antigen levels. So for ALIC61, two target biomarkers were developed in order to support preclinical toxicology studies in Sinomobis monkey, and these were the total and free soluble IL-6 receptor. So for total IL-6 receptor, the levels were expected to increase upon drug administration, so upon administration of ALIC61, due to the formation of complexes uh, with its target, which prolongs the elimination half-life of IL-6 receptor. As ALIC61 interference was observed in diagnostic ELISAs, an in-house sandwich ELISA was developed and validated the dynamic range from 10 to 450 nanograms per mile at the plasma level. On the other hand, for free IL-6 receptor, the levels um, were expected to become undetectable 
upon in X61 administration, also due to the uh, complex formation with, with the drug. So the levels were expected to range from zero in case of fully equipped IL-6 receptor to the basin levels in Cynomogus monkey plasma, which are about 10 to 30 nanograms per mole. As diagnostic kits were not available uh, to measure free IL-6 receptor, uh, we developed in-house um, an assay. And initially, we tried to develop an ELISA-based assay, but this failed due to the formation of a new equilibrium. So therefore, we switched to the GyroLab as a preferred platform, since it has the advantage that there is a very short contact time of the sample with the cone. So now I will focus on development and especially the validation of this challenging biomarker assay on GyroLab, measuring free IL-6 receptor levels in final mongoose monkey samples. But how did the assay format look like? So we have our strap, strap of within beads, pre-coated on each column of GyroLab CD, and there we captured the bitonated IL-6 receptor binding building block of ALX61 at an optimized concentration of 3,000 nanomolar. So then the samples were loaded onto the column, and only three IL-6 receptor was captured onto this column. Due to the very short contact time here of the sample with the column, the preformed ALX61 IL-6 IL receptor complexes didn't get the opportunity to form a new equilibrium, as was the case in ELISA. So, and then IL-6 receptor was detected with an Alexa 306 or 7 labeled antibody against IL-6 receptor. So for this, for this purpose, two detection antibodies were originally compared, and one with the lowest background and the highest window was chosen, and the concentration and percentage of amplification was optimized to be 10 nanometers and 5%. So samples were then finally analyzed using the BIO-FE studies, so only one microliter per sample was loaded onto each column, which is also a big advantage compared to ELISA. Here you can see an overview of the Adlings biomarker assay validation flow. So this, of course, starts with development and pre-validation. So in this stage, the minimum required dilution, or MOD, of the assay is determined. Matrix interference through selectivity and specificity experiments is assessed and also dilution reality is evaluated. And finally, also the calibrators, uh, the dynamic range, and the limits of quantifications are set. Then validation starts. So in this stage, the whole pitch uniformity, stability, and spark recovery is tested, and the accuracy and precision of the calibrators and the validation samples is calculated. Validation is always followed by in-study validation. So in this stage, samples are reanalyzed and checked for their stability. The accuracy and precision of QC samples is monitored during sample analysis. And last but not least, parallelism needs to be demonstrated. So to start with the development of the free IL-6 receptor assay, for the calibrators, um, it was decided to use Rexit H, which is a commercially available gyrolab buffer, as, the, as a diluent. So the curve ranged from 0 0.1 to 30 nanograms per mL at CD level and it was fitted using a five-parameter logistic fit. But contrary, a matrix had to be chosen for the validation samples. However, the endogenous IL-6 receptor concentration in monkey plasma was higher than the anticipated lower limit of quantification. But then several plasma pools were screened, and actually by luck, an IL-6 receptor-free pool was identified. So the final element for the validation samples was Rexit H, containing 2% of this IL-6 receptor-free cyanomorphous monkey plasma. So calibrators were prepared in diluent and validation samples in diluent containing 2% of this matrix. So this needed to be justified during the validation, as was the case. Here, um, the pre-validation parameters are summarized. So minimal or high dilution was determined to be 1 over 50. So as already mentioned, the validation samples were prepared in Rexit H containing 2% of this IL-6 receptor free uh, monkey plasma pool. And samples needed to be diluted 50 times with Rexit H to also find a 2% plasma. Then matrix interference was assessed, and this was okay using 2% plasma. Um, subsequently, deletion linearity should be evaluated. However, in this assay, this was not applicable, as normally um, samples with a concentration uh, above the dynamic range should then be diluted to a concentration within the dynamic range. However, as the free L6 receptor levels were expected to decrease upon drug administration, there was no, ne no need to evaluate the deletion linearity. And then finally, during pre-validation, the concentrations of the validation samples and limit of quantifications were set. So for the lower and upper limit, limit this was respectively 0.2 and 20 nanograms per mL at CD level, so in 2% plasma, which corresponded with a dynamic range ranging from 10 to 1,000 nanograms per mL at CD level, covering the baseline levels very well. So upon pre-validation, validation starts. And here you can see all parameters and acceptance criteria. 
So first of all, the whole page, or in this case, city uniformity, uh, was assessed, and here the precision of responses should be below 10%. And secondly, the calibrators, the accuracy and precision of each calibrator is calculated and should be within 15% for actually each calibrator in the prospective dynamic range. For the validation samples, the accuracy based on both actual and absolute values is calculated and also intra and inter assay precision. And all these parameters should be within 25%. And then finally, for the validation sample, samples, also the total error is calculated and this should be below 30%. Matrix interference is also assessed through uh, performing of mix experiments in which samples are mixed in a one over one ratio and also using some spike recovery experiments. Here the accuracy should be within 25% for more than 75% of the individuals. And then finally during validation, room temperature, free stall and term freezer stability is assessed and here the percent difference versus reference should also be below 25%. To start the validation, uh, first of all, whole city uniformity was assessed. So here the medium validation sample was applied across all microstructures of one by FE thousand CD. And the precision was of responses was 4.9%, so well below the 10% acceptance criteria. Secondly, the calibrators, these were always analyzed in duplicate on the first two segments of every CD. In the figures below, we can see from left to right the intercurve precision, accuracy, and total error. In these figures, the red dotted lines represent the acceptance criteria. So as you can see, all calibrators within the, within the dynamic range, which is represented by the green area, passed all criteria very well. Then the validation samples, the, these were also analyzed in duplicates, but, but actually for three biological replicates. So at the beginning, middle, and end of each CD. So two lower limits of quantifications were evaluated, a low, medium, and high validation sample, and also an upper limit of quantification. Here you can see the results for intra, inter, and overall precision. And as you can see, um, this passed, precision passed for all validation samples. So precision was below the 25% acceptance criteria. And secondly, accuracy is also calculated based on both the actual, actual and absolute values. So as you can see again, um, this nicely passed for all validation samples. Then a total error is represented as actual, the actual value of the relative error plus or minus the inter assay precision. So similar as for the calibrators, the red dotted lines again represent the acceptance criteria. So total error nicely passed for all validation samples. Stability, this is analyzed for each validation samples. And stability samples are prepared in bulk at the start of each stability study. But prior to storage at minus 80 degrees, a uh, fixed receptor concentration was measured and taken as a reference value for further analysis. So for each analysis, three files were taught, and a uh, fixed receptor concentration was measured and compared with the reference, reference value. So then the accuracy should be um, below 25%. For room temperature, five hours failed. However, three hours passed. So then we decided that we could we could maximally run three CDs simultaneously, knowing that about each CD takes maximally one hour for analysis. Then the four freeze pulse cycles also passed, and up to one month freeze stability at minus 80, minus 80 degrees could be confirmed. And finally, during validation, matrix interference was also assessed. So the first example is a spike recovery experiment, in which seven individuals were spiked with the low validation samples. So as you can see, um, only one sample or individual failed for accuracy, so it was higher than 25%, but overall, more than 75% of the individuals passed the criteria. Yet the second example is a mixed experiment, so seven individuals were mixed in a one over one ratio. So here, the expected concentration is the average of the two um, nominal concentrations of each individual, which were also measured in um, this mixed experiment. So as you can see, all these mixed samples passed the 25% acceptance criteria very well, which confirmed that there is no matrix interference. So to conclude the validation, here you can see an overview of the validation um, for both the total and the free IL-6 receptor assay. So whole plate uh, or for the free CD uniformity um, passed very well in both assays. A calibration proof was obtained with a dynamic range with an acceptable precision and accuracy. And the dynamic range ranged from 10 to 1,000 nanograms per mL in free IL-6 receptor assay. And here also a limit of detection or LOD 
calculated to be one nanograms per mole at the plasma level. So our six receptor concentrations above one nanogram per mole, but below 10 nanograms per mole autodynamic range, we reported knowing that these values were not that accurate and precise, precisely measured. measured. So matrix interference, um, as you can see, this nicely passed for the total IL-6 receptor assay. And as shown before, it is also nicely passed for uh, the mixed experiments and spike recovery low validation samples in the free IL-6 receptor assay. However, this just failed for spike recovery uh, with high validation sample. However, um, overall, for all these matrix experiments, uh, a good performance uh, was obtained. Stability was confirmed for both room temperature free star and freeze stability in the free IL-6 receptor assay, while in the total IL-6 receptor assay, up to 24 hours room temperature, room temperature stability uh, for free star cycles and two months freeze stability was confirmed. So in conclusion, both assays were validated. As mentioned before, validation is always followed by in-study validation. So first of all, samples are reanalyzed. And here the percent difference versus the original measurement should be below 25%. And this should be above uh, for more than 75% of the samples. So during study validation, up to five months freeze stability could be confirmed. And also two free star cycles were uh, analyzed successfully. And then last but not least, parallelism needs to be demonstrated. So here the recovered concentrations at different dilutions of one sample must have a precision below 25% which is represented in the dilution plot um, at the right. And this should pass for more than 75% of the samples. So for this assay, six samples were analyzed for parallelism, and actually five of them passed the criteria. So overall, more than 75% of the individuals passed uh, parallelism. So parallelism was demonstrated, and as such, in study validation, confirmed actually the validation of this assay. So now I will uh, show you the fertility of these two target biomarker assays using some preclinical biomarker results. The example I will show is from the single dose, dose range finding study in Cyanomogus monkey. There were several dosing groups, um, so placebo and a one up to 100 mg per kick single administration of ALIC-61. In the figures below, uh, you can see at the left uh, the total IL-6 receptor levels and at the right the corresponding free IL-6 receptor levels. So for the total levels, the levels increased upon ALX61 administration, and after a certain time period, they started to decrease again. This time, this time period was dose dependent, and then they came back to baseline. However, a complete opposite figure was obtained for the free IL6 receptor levels. So upon ALX61 administration, the levels decreased and became unmeasurable, meaning that the measured total levels at these time points were completely complexed with ALX61 and as thus inactive. A similar dose-dependent effect was observed for the free IL-6 receptor levels. So at the time the total levels started to decrease again, the free levels became measurable again. Besides this correlation, there was also a good inverse correlation between both um, target biomarkers and ALIC-61 concentrations. So the figure at the left, you can see the PK profile from three animals within the highest dosing group. And the corresponding PD profile showing the total IL-6 receptor levels um, of the same animals. So for example, for the animals in red and blue, they showed very similar ALX61 concentrations, which was also the case for the total IL-6 receptor levels. If you compare this uh, with the green animal, which showed uh, somewhat higher circulating ALX61 concentrations, which especially lasted longer, the same effect was seen uh, for the biomarker. So somewhat higher total IL-6 receptor levels were obtained, which also lasted longer. These results were confirmed in a 13-week repeated dose toxicity study, from which we could conclude that total and free IL-6 receptor can be valid biomarkers indicating the presence of active drug. So now I want to end with some conclusions. ALIC-61 is not a potent nanobody drug candidate targeting IL-6 receptor. A gyrolab based target biomarker assay was developed for ALIC-61 using a fit-for-purpose development and validation strategy. So this assay measured three IL-6 IL receptor concentrations upon drug administration, and here the identification of the appropriate assay platform was key to success. And the required dynamic range was obtained with an acceptable precision and accuracy. 
So these preclinical biomarker results demonstrate that both total and free soluble IL-6 receptor can be valid biomarkers, indicating the presence of active drug. Based on the PK epidemial link, a safe clinical starting dose was chosen for AX61, which, which is currently in a phase 1 2 study for the treatment of patients with ARM. So AX61 is targeting IL-6 receptor, which is a well-validated target with an established mode of action in a clinically validated pathway. It has the potential to be commercially validated, as shown by its benchmark probe Tembra, and proof of concept is already shown in our patients. Furthermore, ALX61 has an additional potential in order to be used. On the other hand, ALX61 can also be differentiated product, since it is, it is not an antibody, so there is a possibility to, for different treatment options. It also has the opportunity for more convenient dosing frequency, and uh, last but not least, it has the potential to show superior benefit risk ratio. So this was the end of my presentation, and of course I would like to thank some people in particular who all contributed to the success of this project so far. Thank you very much, Ariel. That's a uh, wonderful uh, illustration of a, of a thorough validation process, and uh, it's uh, commendable. While you were speaking, a couple of questions came in I think that are relevant, and maybe you, you really answered them along the way, but uh, one of the questions was, isn't there an issue with running a 5-CD run, say, with reagents for an assay where the, room you know, the, the assay is essentially run at room temperature? And you know, I think this was something that you, va you, you questioned and validated as part of your, your development scheme. But maybe just for the sake of completion, this is something that you check when you do a, a new assay? Yes, indeed. Uh, we always check the stability of our reagents. And here specifically for IL-6 receptor in the sample, we really saw that five hours room temperature, for example, um, failed, but three hours passed. So then we decided to maximally run three CDs simultaneously. So this takes maximally three hours then, confirming the three hours uh, room temperature stability. So, so when you actually ran your samples, did you, did you run three CD runs typically? I think we did two, three, oh, I can't remember, but I think maximally three at least, yeah. Okay. I know for my own part, I, I know uh, have had worked with biomarker such as TNF alpha, which is also suffers from temperature stability problems. And there, like you found, Ariel, we wouldn't run any more than three CD run. So I think it's an important consideration for any assay that you're developing. You have to keep in mind that over the course of running the assay, it needs to have stability at room temperature. Yes, indeed. I think yeah, for every assay, um, you really need to take into account uh, the room temperature stability of your reagents. So we always check this during validation of our biomarker assays uh, at Ablings. Thank you. In the interest of time, I'll go ahead and pass the microphone on over to Mark Dysinger, who works in the Pharmacokinetics, Dynamics, and Metabolism group at Pfizer. And he's going to talk to us about GLP-1 quantitation. So we've heard the clinical late-stage preclinical uh, validation of an assay. I think now Mark will talk to us a bit more about something earlier in the discovery realm. Mark? Oh, thanks for the, uh, the introduction, Rob, and thanks for the opportunity to present today. I want to talk today about glucagon-like peptide 1 and um, how Gyros quantifies it compared to other common detection platforms. As a brief outline here, I'm going to start by telling you about GLP-1 structure and function. We'll talk about its importance as a biomarker for both obesity and diabetes, but particularly diabetes and why we'd want to be quantifying it in the first place. We'll review quantitation by colorimetric ELISA historically, quantitation by an MSD ligand binding assay, and of course, quantitation by gyros. And then I will summarize how they all compare to each other and where the advantages of each are. So let's start talking about GLP-1, the structure, what it is. It's a 30 amino acid gut hormone. It's only 3.4 kD. It's not very big. It's highly conserved among mammalian species. And the active form, the 736, is released in response to food intake. And there's an enzyme, DPP4, that degrades the active form, 736, to an inactive 936 form. Now, th I'm, I'm giving you a pretty general broad range here. Typical endogenous concentrations in so-called healthy subjects range anywhere from 8 to 15 picomolar. Now, if you're looking for a concentration based on the kilodalton, that's about anywhere from 27 to 50 picogram per mil. So let's talk about GLP-1 function and why we want to be measuring it in the first place. 
It's secreted from intestinal L cells with meal ingestion. And it does a number of things in human and animals. It enhances glucose stimulation insulin release. It decreases glucagon release. And two very important things, it slows gastric emptying and it reduces food intake. Now in animals and in vitro, it's been shown to increase insulin gene transcription and increases beta cell mass and cell differentiation. So interesting segue, we're talking about obesity and diabetes. Here is a snapshot through the year 2000 of obesity trends in this country. And um, as we all know, there are many components, genetics, diet, physical activity, socioeconomics. Um, there's actually been interesting studies showing that uh, the poorest regions of our country happen to be the most obese. So there is definitely a socioeconomic component to it. But we're interested in the metabolic component of it. Most gut hormones and enzymes, including GLP-1, they play key roles that have downstream effects on metabolism and weight. There are others such as insulin, glucagon, ghrelin, uh, leptin, but right now we're going to focus on GLP-1. And in an obese population, obese patients and subjects, typical endogenous concentrations of GLP-1 are only 4 picomolar. So again, healthy population between 8 and 15 typically, so we're already looking at a substantially lower concentration. Diabetes. Here's a graph showing percent with diabetes and number with diabetes from 1958 through 2006. So we have about a 50-year snapshot here. Typical endogenous concentrations from a diabetic population or diabetic subject is about 3 picomolar. So again, we're talking well below the 8 to 15 picomolar range for a healthy subject population. Now you would assume, of course, with the growth in the population of our country that the number with diabetes would grow accordingly. But what's really, really disturbing here is if you look at the red line, we have increased 1,400% in the percentage of people with diabetes from 50 years ago. So because of all this, because it reduces glucose levels by regulating pancreatic secretion, it's of great interest and importance in diabetes as both a biomarker and a potential therapy. And there are some GLP-1 therapies out there. They're, they're not primary therapies. They're tier two therapies. Trigenta is an inhibitor of that DDP4. Remember, that's the enzyme that cleaves the 736 active form to the 936 inactive form. And Victoza and Bayetta, these are two GLP-1 receptor agonists. So there's already several players in the GLP-1 field. So let's review basic colorimetric ELISA. This has been done for a long time not just for GLP-1, for several analytes. Um, it's widely used and it's come a long way in terms of sensitivity. You know, um, 10 years ago, we would not be measuring picogram per mil concentrations with colorimetric ELISA, but the, the antibody purification and specificity has grown by leaps and bounds in the past decade or so, and that has made this, um, you know, you don't just default to saying, well, we can't use ELISA because it's not sensitive enough. The advantages, um, cost per well, it's relatively simple. Most people know about it. It's widely available at CROs. Some of the disadvantages, uh, the narrow dynamic range, typically you only have one or one and a half logs. Um, there are multiple wash steps, so you can't really walk away from it completely. There are potential sample volume requirements, and um, along with that, there's always potential for solid phase ex extraction. Here's a brief performance summary according to manufacturer kit protocols. Um, what I want you to concentrate on is the calibration range right here. Now, sensitivity, limit of detection, I'm going to get on my soapbox a little bit. I'm from an analytical lab, and I know some of you share this opinion. Um, limits of detection in an analytical lab are fairly meaningless. We want to know what the lower limit of quantitation is. I don't care how low your assay measures. I care how low it can reliably and reproducibly measure. Um, so if you look at the lower end of the calibration ranges here, we're talking 200 picogram, 4 and 2 picomolar, and 100 picogram. So yes, if you're measuring, if, if you're measuring healthy subjects, they are, are all well within these calibration ranges. But again, remember, obese and diabetic patients, they're down in that 3 to 4 picomolar range. And um, that's average. You're going to have many that are well below that. So depending on the project needs, you may need greater sensitivity than what's in ELISA. So let's review MSD. We're all familiar with MSD. 
use of the electrochemical luminescent technology. You have light counts from a redox reaction out of the raw data. Advantages, this has a greater dynamic range. Um, they claim five log sensitivity. I have not seen that. I've seen three or three and a half, which is a definite advantage over color metric. Um, smaller sample volume requirements, and there is no stop step. Disadvantages, th this again, we're talking about cost. Uh, multiple wash steps, so again, it's not fully automated. They have proprietary labeling chemistries and CRO availability. They're, they're, they're fairly prevalent CROs, but they don't have complete penetration into all of them. Here's some data from some GLP-1 assays. These are commercial kits that we validated in-house, an active kit and a total kit. You can tell given dynamic range, precision, accuracy, sample volume requirements and assay time, they're fairly identical. Dynamic range, 1.5 picomolar. Not limit of detection, but limit of quantitation right there, 1.5 picomolar. So already we're doing better than some of the color metric ELISA claims. These are second version GLP kits that did not require any solid phase extraction. Previous assays had required that, so already we're looking at better throughput and a reduced sample volume requirement. These were not multiplex, these were standalone assays. And around this time, there was a push for throughput in terms of automation. About this time, Pfizer had gone through one of its reorgs, and our group shrunk by a significant percentage. And it was also happens to be at this time that Gyros, Kelly Intahar, contacted me and said, you know, you guys have been asking about some GLP-1 reagents for a while. How would you like to beta test some? And we enthusiastically said yes. So Rob has already covered the, uh, the GyroLab technology. I'm not going to really spend any time on this. We're all familiar. It's pretty simple. It's one of those things that you think, well, why didn't somebody think of this before? So uh, GLP-1 quantitation, let's review the reagents and buffers. Any of the antibodies or standards that I list here are commercially available. Nothing here is homegrown at Pfizer. So for the total assay and the active, we have different captures. They're both mouse anti-GLP-1 monoclonals, just different immunogens. And the daily one is a generic PBS 0.01% between 20. The detection antibody is an Alexa 647 labeled mouse anti GLP 1 monoclonal. It's the same detection for either assay, for both total and active. And the detection daily one is the Rexip F. The reference standard is a commercially available human GLP 1, the 736 form. The matrix is charcoal stripped human plasma pooled. And the standard QC sample daily one was a P1H prototypical buffer provided by Gyros. A two-wash assay. This is a two-wash assay. The first wash is, again, the generic PBS tween. The second wash is a 0.5% SDS, 20% ethanol in distilled water. And to maximize our potential sensitivity, we use BioAppy CD 1000, the 1000 nanoliter CDs. So initial buffer demo runs for active on the left and total on the right. So what we see here is titration. We see a dose response in terms of the concentration of the signal, and um, it's a great start. These were done in buffer. However, you might notice right there that outlier with the total assay down towards the bottom of the curve. So let's talk outliers a bit. Rob alluded to this earlier, and I can give you a concrete example here. In duplicates, any one of us can look at that point and know which one of those is the outlier. However, if you want to mathematically justify removal of that outlier, it's hard to do with only two points. Um, even for something as simple as a gap test, you usually need a minimum N of three. So what you can do is use the GyroLab viewer. That outlier like there, you can see where the signal is coming from. And right here within the pink is the integration area. That signal is really not in the integration area. Conversely, if you look at the standard point that is actually on the curve, what we have is the signal well within the integration area. Back here, this is a little bit of background noise, what Rob often calls shrapnel. It's not contributing to the signal. So compare the outlier, no signal really from the integration area, to the one that is on the curve, signal well within the integration area. And so what I'm saying is, depending on the regulatory status of your lab, you can use the GyroLab viewer to justify removal of an outlier from a duplicate. So we looked at these results and we saw some of these aggregations. We figured, well, this column profile suggests that we really need to centrifuge the detection antibody down in subsequent runs. So we learned from it. So here's a total GLP-1 detection antibody titration in buffer. We came down here, we look at a 12 and a half, 6.25, and 3.25 nit. The slope is generally the same for each, and it looks like the 6.25 is giving us the best signal to background ratio at the low end. Again, this is in buffer. 
So here we look at it with a matrix evaluation. What we did was we took a curve, we prepared it at two times the concentration, and we diluted it one to two in both plasma and buffer, and we ran. And you can see here that these curves are pretty much on top of each other. They're, you know, it, one experiment here, you have a good example of parallelism. And the QCs in the 50% plasma, you can see here the percent bias passes very well, particularly for a low-level 3.1 picomolar QC. That's very good bias, excellent precision on all counts. So there's minimal matrix effects, and all three QC concentrations pass. However, we, we really believe that matrix samples require a matrix curve, because I'm going to show you some examples in a couple minutes here where a buffer and a matrix curve do not line up. We acknowledge that there are situations where um, an analyte may not be able to be removed through treatment, either charcoal stripping or heat activation. You may have to use surrogate matrix or a buffer curve. But if you do so, uh, be sure you can justify it to the agency. We really want to have our curves and QCs mimic the samples as much as possible. So the active GLP-1 matrix evaluation. Here's an example where the red line, the buffer, is actually showing different than the 50% plasma. There's a clear matrix effect. So this is an example of how they would not actually run on top of each other. So we have a clear matrix effect here with the detection at 12 and a half nanomolar. The question is, can we titrate this away? We just threw a lot at once. You can see down here, we started at 100 nanomolar all the way down to 3.13. Up here at 100 nanomolar, there's simply too much antibody. It's scatter plotted, it's aggregating, there's too much. But as you work your way down, this yellow line right here, this 3.13, looks like it is a winner in terms of signal to background at the low end. This is a truncated curve right here. We didn't go all the way up to 400 this time. This is 12 and a half down. So here's detect titration confirmation. So you remember that the, the total assay, when it had matrix, it had the matrix curve above the buffer. Here we have the, yes, this mint green line right here is the buffer. And here we have a case where when you introduce matrix into it at 50%, it's actually running below. It's actually running the, uh, the C value of that curve is actually far more forward to the right in that assay. Detection antibody 3.13 nanomolar seems to give the best signal to background for 50% plasma. So here's the optimized assay. We're moving forward with the active assay. The total we can go back to. So the capture antibody 100 microgram per mil, and um, that is the default concentration. We like that. You know, you're going to saturate the beads in the microstructure, and that's one piece of the assay that you don't need to optimize. We have our detection antibody at 3.13 in the Rexit F. The standard QC samples were prepped in matrix and then diluted one to two in the prototypical buffer. We have an 11 point standard curve from 400 on down to 0.39 picomolar. And for this, in this several next runs, we're looking at QC samples scattered at the low end of the curve. We are confident with the mid and upper range. We're looking to find the LLOQ here. Again, 1000 CD bioaffy, the double wash, and our photomultiplier tube setting is at 5%. So here's the optimized assay curve in 50% plasma, given the parameters I just gave to you. You'll notice that there's good titration. What you're also going to notice is down here towards the bottom of the curve, we're starting to lose some precision. But you'll also notice over here on the left, we're starting to really approach the detection limits of the instrument. So the question is, since we're really pushing the low end, how does it perform quantitatively? Well, let's answer that question. Here's the optimized regression model from the assay you just saw. This is back calculated concentrations. And as you can see, our percent bias and percent CV in this meaty part of the curve right here is actually really, really good. In fact, that's outstanding. However, when you get to 1.56 through 0.39, we start to lose our bias and we start to see an increase in the percent CV. But what we're doing here is we're measuring our measuring stick, which can give you confidence, but can also overinflate your confidence. So the real measure of the low, assay, low end assay performance would be an assessment of these samples, of samples independent from the curve extrapolated back off of it. We made some QCs at really low concentrations, 1.56 all the way down to 0.52. You can see here down through 0.78, that our percent bias is well within normal range. Um, you know, some of the white papers for biomarkers actually claim 25 to 30 percent for an LLOQ in terms of percent bias. And over here at percent CV, we're well within good. But as soon as we go down to 0.52, our percent bias goes up 
and it is fairly reproducible that we can't quantify there. So these are not results from a single assay. These are a compilation of results that we, we confirm this over and over again over a matter of several days that 0.78 really is the LLOQ of this assay. So I'm going to share with you a little bit of data that's going to go into a publication later this year. I just showed you how the assay performs with QCs and standards prepared in pooled serum, but how about, how does it work in terms of incurred samples? Well, we took six incurred samples and evaluated them on each of two disks. These are independent sample aliquots so that freeze-thaw was not a concern. Here are our subject numbers, and here is the results in picomolar for disk one, and here are the results for disk two. You see here a very high level of agreement, very high level. And our summary statistics, what we're most impressed with is over here, the percent CV. Now, you all know the nature of the math, percent CV, the lower the number, typically the higher the CV is, just based on the formula that we use to derive it. These are outstanding CVs, a really high degree of precision from disk to disk for such low concentration samples. We are extremely pleased with that. So next steps for us, finish optimization of the total GLP-1 assay, then validate. The active GLP-1 data that I just shared with you was a qualified assay. The instrument is in a regulated environment. We did pretty much everything but the paperwork because the instrument is still undergoing validation and the LIMS interface between the gyro lab and our Watson LIMS is still being done. So we couldn't validate it, but I did went through the exercise and it's been qualified. So we we're very confident in that data. We want to do the same thing. We finish up the total GLP-1 and then start looking for more biomarkers to put on. So let me summarize. GLP-1, I think I've shown that's a pretty important biomarker for obesity and diabetes. So we need accurate quantitation in order to understand those conditions. Colometric ELISA and MSD have been used with success, but they have their respective limitations. So the gyro lab, I think we've already, uh, Chad talked to this earlier and Rob has talked to this and we saw it in real time here, a rapid assay development very common antibody labeling schemes, and several runs can be done in a single day. So you can run a disk, and an hour later you have data, you can make a method development decision, run another one, et cetera, et cetera. You can run several in one day. What would take a week with microtiter plating and colometric or fluorometric ELISA, you can do in a day with a jar lab if you're willing to put in the time. So the qualified active GLP-1 assay yields twice as much sensitivity compared to MSD, a higher ULQ, and excellent reproducibility with incurred samples. The minimal sample volume requirements yield numerous advantages, particularly when dealing with rare matrices such as CSF, tears, saliva, things like that. Automated assays allow for higher values of FTE time. And finally, disadvantages, well, CRO availability is improving. They, there are more out there, and the numbers are growing every quarter. And there has been some grumbling about CD and consumables costs, but it's all about where you want to put your money. If you can enable a project team to make a decision quicker because you're providing data quicker, is, you, know, you, you may be saving time in terms of FTE time for assay development for other platforms. So it's all about where you want to put your money. So I'd just like to acknowledge here at Pfizer, Kathy Soderstrom, Stephanie Fraser, and Diane Mears. They did a lot of the legwork and assay development for the other platforms that I shared with you. And from Jairos, Rob Durham, the field application scientist, he put in a lot of work on this. Um, he enabled us to move forward with a lot. And simply put, if it wasn't for him, a lot of this would not have gotten done. Joy for the invite. Kelly for the invitation to test out the GLP-1 reagents. Mike Feely, the regional sales manager. And Catherine for making things happen and doing what she does. And with that, I'll turn it back over. Thanks a lot, Mark. Appreciate it. Very, very nice presentation. So there are a few there are a few questions coming in. I think that could be handled by a number of the presenters. But uh, I'll just I'll just talk to you. Did, did we use a two wash method, or do you routinely use a two wash method for the um, GLP-1 assay? On the gyros, yes. Because the, G, the GLP is a somewhat sticky protein, so you wanted to have that double wash to make sure you're not having any carryover into the next uh, into the next spot on the CD from the needles. Yeah, I think for the for the non gyros aficionados out there, uh, in our parlance, a double wash method just means that the transfer needles that are used in the liquid handler are going to be washed with a stringent wash first, and then rinsed in a less stringent wash second. 
so that we assure, we deal with any potential for carryover. It is a liquid handling system that it can have carryover issues, and uh, we, we deal with those straight on as part of the assay development that we undertake on the system and would, would do whatever we need to do in terms of wash buffers or diluents to uh, ensure that there's uh, good reproducibility test after test and uh, make sure that there aren't any carryover related issues as part of the assay development. Uh, one of the one of the questions that comes up, and it was a it was a subject of a couple of them, is the idea of running batches, batch to batch variation. And I think this is something you know people have to really get begin to get comfortable with. And you know, I'm in a situation now where I go into a lab and I typically run a one CD run at a time as we're doing assay development or not doing a production sort of an assay. So. If any of the panelists can talk a little bit about what their feelings are about CD to CD variability, I know that uh, Carrie, with the with the, the validation work that you did, it looked like it was uh, too good to be true almost. But but I mean, what's what's the, what's the reality of this out there? Are, are any of the panelists doing multi CD runs, and then how do you confirm that you're getting good reproducibility? Maybe let's start with you, Carrie. You know, we do a lot like what you were saying. Rob, when we're doing our development, we do a lot of single single uh, CD runs. But the data that I showed, which was four four replicate runs at four different times, four different standard curves, is generally once we get an optimized assay, that's that's the kind of reproducibility that we're observing with the vast majority of our assays. Yeah, I can just speak from the Pfizer perspective. We have not we have not done the due diligence to look at running a five disc set with a single standard curve and placing QCs on subsequent disks. We've just taken a somewhat conservative approach to that. That's not to say that it's not on our planning list to do. Ariella, you, you touched on this a little bit uh, in your presentation. Yes, uh, maybe I can say that uh, indeed uh, during development and validation we mostly run one CD at a time. It's only at uh, once the assay is validated and during sample analysis that we do yeah, multiple CDs, that we run multiple CDs simultaneously. But actually, then we put each calibrator and also QC samples then at each CD. So we really uh, monitor the accuracy and precision of each QC sample then and the calibrate curve on each CD. So yeah, that's the way how we cover it. I think we never put calibrators on one CD and QC samples on another one. Yeah, while I have you, Ariel, there was another question on uh, the 1 to 50 dilution required for the free SIL6 uh, receptor. Did you worry about e equilibrium shifts or anything like that when you were doing the dilutions? Oh, during the dilutions, no, because we initially tried to develop this assay in ELISA, and there we tried to mimic uh, the antigen occupancy, and there we really had problems that a new equilibrium was set um, during the incubation of the assay. But once we switched the assay to the Jarla platform, where there is a short contact time of the sample with the column, we never encountered problems with that any anymore. So the theoretically occupancy then really was a measured occupancy then. Okay, I, I hope, hope that, that answered the question that came in. Uh, thank you. Mark, have you have you yet done any ex experiments where you've looked at multi-CD runs? Is that something that you've had to, to deal with yet? I know you're still early days for putting this assay into production. My approach to it, I think, um, Ariella spoke to this a little bit. I have not. I, what I've done is loaded two PCR plates with the samples and standards, and I have run one right away, and I've had the other one just sit for you know three hours at room temperature. That way, I'm not burning through CDs. And then I run that one at about the three or four hour point to see if there's any effect. And so far, with the with the couple assays that I've worked with, it has not been an issue. That okay. doesn't mean that it that won't be an issue for other analytes of interest, but um. That has been my approach. I just thought instead of running five full CDs, why don't I just run one up front to get a baseline for T0 and then hold reagents in that microwell plate from which they will be pulled to put on the CD for a fixed amount of time and then run that assay then to simulate other CDs being run in between them. Yeah, I think this issue, again, it's uh, really related to a uh, case-by-case basis. Uh, we certainly have customers 
who are, are using the system in, in which they put a standard curve on one CD and then we'll have uh, either positive controls or cal calibrators or QCs run on subsequent CDs uh, to confirm that the CD to CD variability is uh, within specifications. So, so I, I, they, they haven't published that data necessarily. Now I'll have to look at, we had a number of posters at the AAPS meeting including some, some PK studies that were done uh, on phase three clinical trials which, uh, which may have been uh, performed in a, in a manner that's more high throughput. I guess what I'll say is I think we've, we've come to the end of our time. This will be available for rebroadcast for a period of time on the CHI website. Subsequent to that, it will be available on our Gyros website, www.gyros.com, where you can have a look at this at your leisure. If you have additional follow-up questions or during the session here we weren't able to answer your question adequately, please feel free to reach out to uh, me uh, and then I in turn can uh, direct you to any of the presenters. I will just say by, by way of uh, commenting on Mark's last slide that says that uh, certainly one of the com uh, complaints we had from uh, pharma was that there weren't uh, many uh, CROs that had our technology and I think that certainly is growing. There are seven now in the U.S. who have our technology. You can look on our website and see who those vendors are and, uh, and even a redundancy at, at some CROs where they have multiple systems. So I think the technology has certainly been adopted by a number of CROs to partner with uh, the pharma organizations out there who are also interested in our technology. With that, I'll just say goodbye and thanks very much for your attendance.